and thanks and welcome everybody and thanks for the invitation. Um, if they're just sudden uh, issues and breaks in the internet connectivity, it's just because of um, all the various uh, electricity and internet related stuff. Um, so I'm just trying to go backwards now on my slides, um, which is proving impossible, it seems. Um, so thanks. And the chat is about HIV related um, weight gain and potentially the whole issue of ARV related weight gain. And thanks to Jeremy for the invitation and for the, um, I woke up a couple of weeks ago with a, one of my worst nightmares coming true, which is the realization that um, for the first time in my life that um, HIV prevention might be more interesting than HIV treatment. And that's because HIV treatment has become so effective that um, it's so safe and so, um, you know, just uh, that it's almost impossible to get resistance. That as long as you get the patient to swallow their tablet and you get them diagnosed, um, it really takes the village idiot to mess it up. Um, so, you know, and treatment is still so in its infancy and, and evolving that it's, uh, you know, it is in many ways a lot more interesting. Um, so I think Jeremy took pity on me after hearing this talk and allowed me to talk about something that um, is very niche now and probably the really the only interesting thing that's happening in HIV treatment at the moment other than the injectables. And that's this, this, this kind of weight gain stuff. So I'm gonna try and go through it. Jeremy, you might have to guide me through the poll issues, which is um, I've added just to, make, to, to, to take it up. So I think the first um, thing is to ask people to, um, I'm not sure, let, oh, there we go. So we've got, um, I'm going to take you through three cases and I'm going to take you back to this first case um, and then ask you some questions about it. Um, and then we're going to have a poll quickly. So the first patient, so hopefully you're all familiar with the advanced study. And if you're not, I'll take you through the results, um, which is the study we did. So we had this 35 year old patient. Um, and while we were swanning around in Mexico presenting the results, um, we had this patient who was on one of the arms on a TAF based arm with um, emtricetabine and who came with a fairly um, low BMI. She was one of our less heavy patients. Um, and she had um, a BMI of 44. And this was despite us giving all the good advice. She would, she'd been trying to diet, she'd been exercising, um, but her weight was going up and up. And we tried to switch her at the time. We thought this was a good idea. And I'll tell you why it was a terrible idea. At the time, we'd switched her back to her favorites, but she'd continued to gain weight. And she was sitting in the clinic at the time we were in Mexico presenting our results to a packed audience in tears and helpless saying, I'm doing everything you're telling me to do, but I'm still gaining weight. So this is horrible. So, you know, we've, and this is almost routine now in the ARV clinics is that people are gaining weight, particularly women, and we have nothing to offer them other than this kind of, this sort of advice of move more and eat less. So we have another patient in our clinic, and this time it's a carbon copy patient, another um, young woman, um, again, with a, um, not quite as heavy, but um, her weight is pretty stable. And all the stuff, all the parameters we worry about, her lipids, her glucose, her blood pressure, all is completely normal. She's, and she's completely happy with her weight in this case. Um, she's very active. She, she's got a really good diet, probably far better than mine. Um, she's got three healthy children. She's happily married. Her biggest gripe is that it doesn't matter whether she's getting the flu vaccine or she's dropped a brick on her toe. This doesn't matter what she does. The minute she walks through the door of her doctor or nurse's clinic um, door, um, they want to fix her weight. That's the first thing they want to do. And she doesn't want her weight fixed. She wants to be left alone. She wants her medical care sorted out. And she, a continual gripe to me is that she's actually healthier than the vast majority of her healthcare workers. And she's probably right if you look at the, the various demographics. Now, the third patient, a very good looking patient, a 53 year old HIV negative active white male. Um, yes, seen sobbing on Table Mountain um, in fear while climbing. BMI of 28. Um, who works very, very hard, exercises regularly, has an untreated LDL that's quite high, um, HDL that's on the low side, blood pressure slightly up, otherwise pretty much everything else is good. Strong family history of young myocardial um, infarction, otherwise on a pretty good diet, very active, has also multiple unsuccessful efforts to lose weight. So that first case I was telling you about, um, I want you to be, um, this is a nice dichotomous thing. Um, we can go, yes, no, Jeremy, I'm not sure how it works with the polling, whether they just say yes or no. Um, 
Yeah, oh, so it's, awesome. it's, it's come up as AD, but you can just go A and B. Yeah. Okay, so A is yes, B is no. Ooh, let's look at them, honestly, so <laughs> hyper. So I want you to be the healthcare advisor for that patient, the first one who was sobbing in your clinic. Now, suddenly I've transformed you into their, their patients. I want them, I want um, you to say that if they follow your advice, are you confident they will lose a significant amount of advice following your advice over the next five years? And I see that. <laughs> so we can so see that they can't get. See this from. Oh, okay. <laughs> we'll give, give, <laughs> give another five seconds and then I'll turn to the audience. You lot are so nice. Such. Okay. All right. So I'm going to uh, share the results to the audience now. Yeah, they can see it. Wonderful. So you lot are so honest. You really don't trust your own advice. So um, according to my the stuff in front of me, 87% of you do not believe that you can lose a significant amount of weight in the next five years. So you also don't trust that you're going to be able to help this poor woman sobbing in front of you. Okay, next, next question. Great. Okay, it said share results, which I think we can write. Uh, Let's get on to the next slide. Um, right. So now we've got seven options here. I'm not sure, Jeremy, what we're going to have to do here. It only gives you five options, I guess. Um, let's get out of this. Um, does it only give us five? I'm trying to think of, OK. Hmm. It does. Um, how about we remove the top two? So we've got yeah. three, four, five, and six, seven to be A, B, C, D. Okay. You're not allowed to choose one or two. Okay. Option three is A, and you get to, to choose from there on. That's a great idea. So um, so you can only choose one, three, four, five, six, and seven. Which one would you choose there? So three is diet and exercise. Four is ARV change. ARV change, I'm just trying to move this thing so I can read my own stuff. Um, change in exercise. Six is suck it up. Um, and you're going to diet and exercise just to stop further weight gain. Seven is send them to the surgeons or try and get these new wonderful new weight loss drugs. Oh, there's lots more pondering this time. Oh, no, there we go. Now people are like... Oof. Just, just quite fun to see. All right, I'm going to give another yeah. five seconds and then I'll, I'll stop the poll and share it. Wow. Okay. It's nice to see so many cynics in the audience as well. <laughs> That's great. Um, cool. Interesting. So if you share the results, Jeremy. Yes, yeah, they can see it now. Oh, uh, good. Okay, so you can see that um, lots of you have said um, diet and exercise. Well, small number of you think diet and exercise. Even smaller group think that ALV change will make any difference and we'll get all to all of this. Um, a group of you that think that ALV change and diet and exercise, bad choice. Um, lots of you, some of you think just suck it up. Um, and the last group, the surgery or the weight loss drugs. And you'll see how why this is actually really a, quite a complicated like thing. Um, cool. Last one. Um, sorry, just trying to get my slides to. So now it's a personalized question. Um, so just for you individually, have you ever tried to lose weight and been successful? And now we've got one, two, and three. So option A is you've never tried to lose weight. In which case you can, have, as I've always said, please report to the hate crime protection group outside the door. Um, two, I've tried to lose weight and I've been successful and you can report to the same group outside the door. Or three, I've tried but it didn't work. And you can vote now. This is quite fun, Jeremy. I really must try this thing <laughs> much more. We we can't see your names, I promise. <laughs> you can, you can Except for you, Bernadette, I can see you actually. And <laughs> Samson's actually yeah, your results, I can see. Cool. I'm gonna end the poll there and share results. Okay. Nice. Okay. So a lot of you have tried. Honestly, this infectious diseases community is just hyper 
honestly, and probably a little bit smug at this point, Jeremy, I think you might have to do something about this. Um, I'm certainly not in that group. I would certainly be in, obviously in group three. Um, so let's chat about all of this as we go through and you can see we can discuss about it at the end. So let's get stuck into the, this, this whole area. Right, moving into the, the talk itself. So you all are familiar how we've moved across from Tenofovir and Efavirenz based regimen, and we've ended up on this wonderful combination of Tenofovir, Dazaproxyl, and Dolutegravir. Um, we may swap out Tenofovir, Dazaproxyl for Tenofovir, Alafenamide. Um, there's not much to choose between the two. The two competing drug companies, um, or the three competing drug companies, will try and convince you that there's much to be that there's some sort of difference there, but I really don't think you need to worry much about it anymore. Um, you'll see that um, if you fail those, you can be move across to other regimens. Please tell me when you failed these so Jeremy and I can be famous with you um, because the number of patients who've actually failed this first line regimen are vanishingly small. And the properly confirmed cases, um, you can probably measure on one hand. The reason we went across to these regimens in the first place and why we designed the advanced study were really around cost. And it's very important to understand that um, the kind of impetus to move across to dollar ticket initially was around a slight improvement in tolerability and cost. Um, the drug combination has been successful beyond our wildest dreams. Um, it really has. Um, and maybe it'll still make our brains or our livers explode. But at the moment, we, the side effect profiles we're seeing, even out to six years, um, are is absolutely phenomenal. So I always joke about this being the most boring study ever, and that's because so little happened in terms of side effects and resistance. Um, if you do clinical trials, this is what you want. You want very boring studies. What you do not want is exciting studies, um, because it makes the paperwork and the, the reporting and the, the reporting out to um, to register to the various like safety people, like a complete pain in the neck. So what we did here was compare the three different regimens. You all look down at the bottom regimen, which is green on my screen, which is the Favrin's based regimen, which has served us really well for the last 10, 10 odd years. The middle regimen, which is the one um, everybody in the public sector is on. Um, and unfortunately, most of the private sector is still on the regimen at the bottom. And then the regimen there at the top, which is what most of Botswana is, is moving into, and some of, of Zambia. And lots of there's lots of pressure on Africa to move across these TAF-based regimens. Um, so at the time we went across this, as I said, you know, there was some evidence that Dolotegra has been tolerated. Um, the combination of TAF, TAF and Dolotegra would be a much smaller tablet and would be significantly cheaper. And that was the reason why we tested it. Um, we did not expect it to be as successful as it was. And now we know it's very, very safe and that it's near impossible to get resistance. Um, and I'm not going to take you through that stuff. You've seen all that data. And it's, as I said, very boring. At the time, Andy Hill, who is a statistician in charge of the study, was noticing that everybody on advance, I was blinded to the data and everybody else on the, on, who was working on the, the um, on the study was blinded to the data. But so Misa Sokello, who works on the study as the primary clinician, came to me at the time in 2019 and said, all of our patients are getting fat. And I said, don't worry, it's just what happens when you're taking antiretrovirals, they're just talking back and turning back into South Africans. Andy Hill had noticed the, that there were these big differences because he was the blinded, unblinded statistician. So he sneakily started doing these retrospectives on all the studies and started publishing papers in other major journals with other major clinicians and started noticing, in fact, that other antiretroviral um, pre-treatment regimens were associated with this new um, clinical obesity indication um, evidence and he published this this article early on um, just showing that people were gaining weight on all these new these new antiretrovirals and he also picked up that there were early indications not just in this german study but in other studies as well and what happened they noticed here is that patients who were switching across so the TAF was kind of flavor of the month. It was very expensive, but everyone was taken up by Gilead's um, data showing better renal and bone markers. So when what they did in this German study is they moved everyone across from Tenofovir across to TAF, and all these patients suddenly put on weight and complained. So they actually moved them back to Tenofovir, um, but they gained weight hand over fist. So this was like one of the first reports showing that patients who moved across these new regimens were gaining weight. Um, and then in 2019, early in 2019, they had the first Croy discussion. 
and they had this thing, this weight themed discussion about gaining weight. Um, and, you know, um, and they looked at integrase inhibitors at this thing and demonstrated as well that um, inhibitors seem to be one of the worst culprits in terms of weight gain. They also started showing that women were more at risk of gaining weight than, than men. You can see here that they were showing also PIs showed more weight gain than any RTIs. So quite complex data coming out of here, but this is all like retrospective US-based data. Um, these were huge retrospectives, um, but retrospectives nonetheless. The other thing they showed was the strong gender and race-based stuff across the different um, classes of drugs. Um, again, quite complicated. I remember going to, this, the, to the, the session and sort of sitting up when I saw this and thinking, oh goodness, this is not good news for Africa and certainly not for South Africa where already we've got an ongoing obesity epidemic. Paul Sachs, um, who's kind of the infectious diseases doctors, infectious, uh, you know, who I think we all sort of genuflect at every time he crops up on Twitter. Um, they put out this, um, took all the Gilead registration studies and then started looking at risk factors and did kind of a meta-analysis in CID and looked at the kind of risk factors for, um, for weight gain and demonstrated that patients who had, um, again, demonstrated this race and gender and sex-based thing that showed that women and black people were more likely to gain weight, also showed that people who had low CD4 counts and viral load, something that's consistently shown in the studies, people who had much more advanced disease had more weight gain. Now, again, you might think, well, that makes sense. You know, you kind of like got a weight that's in your socks because you've like lost all this weight, you're going to gain more weight. And that's, again, was shown in advance and shown in all the, shown in all the other studies. Um, What's also interesting is he showed that dolutegravir and bictegravir, I mean, the two drugs look exactly the same when um, unless you look really closely, um, demonstrate a lot more weight gain. Interestingly, rolpivirine over efavirenz and atazanavir over efavirenz. I don't think anyone's surprised that TAF over AZT, AZT is a bit of a gastrointestinal nuclear bomb, but showed all these drugs that actually was like us, they were all associated with greater um, weight gain than, than the other drugs. So Andy put out this thing which showed that, you know, these association, these different things that seem to be driving weight gain, weight loss. And it was weird because we never really thought about drugs that, that might drive weight loss as opposed to um, weight gain. But in fact, you know, weight gain is, is strongly associated with a broader range of, dr um, range of drugs. And I think many of us are, are well acquainted with things like steroids and the psychiatric drugs, but there are lots of other drugs that, that, that drive weight gain. So many of us like turn around and thought, well, why didn't we ever notice this? Why do we not see weight gain? Why did we not see weight loss? Why do we not see the stuff with, um, with the, the registration studies? And the major reason, um, and this is a study again Andy led, was that most of the registration studies were done on gay white men. And not just any old gay white men, quite rich white gay men, probably with access to really good food and gym instructors and the kind of people who are going to keep weight gain at bay. Now, even you know, this patient population isn't even representative of the North American or European population, let alone of like the average South African population. So it's not surprising that these, this, this weight gain signal was not picked up in the registration studies. And there's a huge amount of criticism now targeted at registration studies saying, you guys really need to enroll, you know, sort of more women and more black people and just generally more of the general population that's going to be looking at these studies. And every time you stand up at an HIV conference and present a registration study, they get hammered because they're battling to actually do these to, to, to kind of rectify this, this demographic um, shift. And when they went back, and Andy took the kind of making a career of this, is going back and looking at, um, at pulling these studies. And he went back and looked at the original PrEP studies where they looked at Tenofovir with um, FTC versus placebo um, and demonstrated actually that in these, these studies, that it actually was about a, um, that Tenofovir was associated with about a kilogram difference in, in weight loss. So it's quite clear that Tenofovir actually does make you lose weight. And that the last 10 years, um, our patients have probably had their weight gain mitigated by having tenofovir as part of the of part of the treatment regimen once we switched across from D4T. So we took one weight loss drug, which was D4T, and added another weight loss drug, tenofovir, on top of that. And we now know that both protease inhibitors and efavirenz are 
are weight loss drugs. They're also associated with weight loss. So we had all these weird weight loss drugs in the mix that we only recognized quite late into the antiretroviral game um, that we're confounding things. It's important when you understand what happened with the advanced study. Anyway. So coming back to advance, and it came out in 2019 and caused this big stir. And the big news was the weight gain. And it was not insignificant weight gain. Um, we had, um, particularly amongst women, this huge surge in weight. Men, it was much more blunted. But even amongst men, it was not insignificant. And we're out to 192 weeks. Um, the weight is quite sustained. I'll show you weight out to, um, to six years in just a moment. But you can see the weight gain is relatively sustained out to 192 weeks, I mean, especially amongst women. There's kind of a plateau that starts happening towards the end of it, but it is pretty constant. Um, it's not like it starts, slows down completely. Um, at the time we presented this, there was complete uproar about, you know, about how much weight was gained, because it wasn't just this, it was the NAM cell study, as well as a wave of other um, retrospectives that were starting to show this weight gain coming out. So as I said, advance was skull numbingly boring, except for this weight gain. Um, what was important is that the woman in the, the study um, in South Africa, these, the, I mean, these people all recruited in Hillbrow, um, actually had quite a high BMI to begin with. So when we started packing on the, the kilograms, they really supersized very, very quickly. And the first initial reaction was that dolitegravir was causing weight gain and thereby association bictegravir and that TAF was causing weight gain. And we were part of that. That was clearly, obviously, the drugs were causing the weight gain. And I think in retrospect, and I'll show you why that was obviously was a big mistake. We now are very clear that dolitegravir doesn't cause weight gain. And many of us don't believe TAF does either. Um, but you can see why we thought that at the time. Um, it was only when we started analyzing the Favrin's data and the, and the Tenofovir data that this very complex thing started to become clear. And it's very clear now that actually HIV induced um, inflammation probably is the major contributor to, to this weird weight gain. That when you shut it down, you get this sudden rise in weight. There's a complex composite of, of the original weight loss from, you know, um, from being sick with HIV and then ongoing weight inflama uh, inflammation and just weird, um, weird ways in which adipose tissue reacts. Um, what was interesting in, um, in advance is it was extremely little changes in the lipids and the glucose and the blood pressure after 192 weeks. In fact, over six years. In the Favrin's arms, you get all the changes that you expect, but in the dolitegravir-based arms, it was very, very little. So the good news about that is that TLD is behaving very, very well other than the weight gain. Now you might say, well, what happens after 10 and 15 years, and that certainly is important, but after six years, we've seen very, very little of the, the bad stuff that we'd expect. Jeremy asked me to send him this data um, a couple of weeks ago for the guidelines about what happens at six years. So in advance, what we did after four years is we switched everyone into the, um, to the um, state program, so it's to TLD, and you can see what happened to the patients. Unfortunately, we've had the paper accepted at CID, it's, it's in print at the moment. And unfortunately, I couldn't get the, we're still adding patients to the cohort because they're still um, moving into the cohort as we speak. Um, and these numbers are actually much bigger now. They're into the 60s from the 20s that you see down there. Um, but what's happening is that the patients behave as you'd expect. The patients on TAF that get so that they can move on to Snofovir, drop their weight down. The patients on TLD actually, um, as opposed to what's been shown here in straight line, you actually do start to plateau, thank goodness, because I think that you know, they end up um, you know, changing the center of gravity of the world if they keep doing what they're doing. While well, the patients on efavirins, once you switch them off efavirins onto the dolitegravir, get quite a sharp rise in weight. So I think you can start preparing your patients for what happened when you move them across um, off efavirins onto the TLD, they start to gain weight. And I bet you many of you have this, this evidence. NAMSAL, which was done at the same time as advanced in Cameroon, and which is um, probably going to report the results at the same time as we did out to 192 weeks, actually saw exactly the same, in fact, worse weight changes than we saw. And Cameroonians are much skinnier than South Africans. So it was, it was interesting. The study design is quite different. They use a much lower dose, well, um, a lower dose of, of efavirins. And we can go into details of that if you're interested. The reason we don't think dolitegravir caused the weight gain was a very, very clever study done by Gary Martin's group in KUCT and um, real respect to them. Gary had to explain the study to me over and over again for me to actually understand it. And what they did there is the two um, 
upper um, the two lower arms, sorry, Gary um, did the genotyping of um, the efavirenz based arm, and he removed all the patients who had, were slow metabolizers of efavirenz. Now, these are the same patients who get hyperlipidemia. They're the ones who get, whose glucose has got up. They're the ones who get the CNS side effects. They're the ones who's, who get their hepatotoxicity. So all the bad stuff associated with efavirenz. They're also the ones who um, metabolize um, efavirenz really slowly. They get these super high levels of efavirenz. They um, you see it particularly amongst black patients. Um, but they're also the patients who get weight loss. They all get very... What Gary showed is the patients with um, slow, um, uh, who are medium uh, metabolizers or normal metabolizers, fast metabolizers of efavirenz, actually had exactly the same weight gain as, as the dolutegavir arm, the middle arm, the TLD arm. Essentially showing that the weight gain is the weight loss or mitigation is entirely driven by the slow metabolizers of efavirenz. So the only way you can get weight mitigation is to switch across the efavirenz and hope that they're a slow metabolizer, which is the entire group of efavirenz patients who can get all the worst side effects, which is a shocking idea. So efavirenz essentially, to my mind, this was the kiss of death for efavirenz, as well as the fact that it was showed, it makes it very, very clear that it's not dolutegavir that's driving it. So a very complex study, but a brilliantly done study and executed by um, Pumla Tsinkabi now um, heads that, that unit. And yeah, some very, very crafty research done there. Now, I'll show you some stuff that is very reassuring about weight gain on HIV, but it's important to remember that there are real consequences to having this amount of weight gain. And one of them is in pregnancy. Now, HIV loves a good controversy, and the whole of 2017 was consumed with neural tube defects and carrying on about neural tube defects in the Sapama study done in Botswana. It was a very good study, but in the final analysis, it's it's of questionable. Um, it's questionable whether there ever was a neural tube defect signal. We've done some modeling studies show there are far more consequences to being obese and being pregnant than there ever was with the neural tube defect um, study from Tepama. But no one's ever even um, thought to actually question the, the weight gain that we're seeing um, and the issues around pregnancy, which are probably going to have profound impact on on outcomes on both infant and on mom. Um, going forward in terms of, um, of the HIV program. Um, coupled to all of this is, was a curveball that came at us earlier this year in the HIV community. <laughs> um, something from the RESPOND cohort. Um, so this looked at a very large um, database um, done um, in Europe and Australia, and they looked at patients who were switched to integrase inhibitors, the, um, not, not um, Bictegavir, but Dolutegavir and some of the older integrase inhibitors. And, and they didn't look at big Tegavir because it was a slightly older group of um, cohort. The big Tegavir hadn't come across at the time. And they bizarrely enough showed a doubling of cardiovascular risk when patients were moved across to, to these integrase inhibitors. Now, two very good looking in, um, infectious diseases, South Africans wrote a, a, a very good um, review that you can go and read about this in Lancet HIV. But one of the, some of the speculation at the time was that this was weight related, that integrase inhibitors it seemed a bit unlikely that, you know, sudden increase in weight would, would, um, would suddenly drive your cardiovascular risk. Um, but this is one of the things that was actually put out there and people still are, just can't really explain why there would be suddenly this, this sudden increase in, in cardiovascular risk. So where are we now with this weight gain stuff? Yeah, drug, I can't think of good reasons to actually use if I any longer. We're pretty certain, I see my internet, you might have missed me there for a few seconds. Dolotegavir is not driving weight gain. We don't have any data to support any switch strategy from one, um, from one, from integrase inhibitors to any other drug. You know, lots of people are using Deraverine um, in other countries. There just is no real study to support that. We're busy with the study to look at that, but we don't know. There are studies now that Islatravir is being studied again, which will be published hopefully in, um, at CROI in February. Um, and there's studies looking at lenacapavir and, and Islatravir, comparing it to um, bictegavir based regimens. And that data hopefully will be published, as I said, in at CROI and give us some sense 
of comparators to other regimens as to how TAF is performing and how the other integrase inhibitors are compared to other classes of drugs. And I think most people don't think TAF is doing very much else. They think that TAF and the integrase inhibitors are just weight neutral, that these other old drugs were actually causing weight mitigation or weight, even weight loss. And that tenofovir actually is a weight mitigator. It's a kind of a weight loss drug, and that, but its effect is very modest. And that these, low, these advanced diseases and women with um, black women are most at risk. And that's the, a lot of our switch patients, it's always important to remember that the vast majority of patients, when you change regimens, are actually switch patients. You know, the classic naive, ARV naive patient is actually quite rare in this day and age. You know, like new um, patients, a lot of what are naive patients are actually just restarts. Patients who are too scared to tell the doctor or the nurse that they actually fell off treatment for whatever reason um, in the past. Um, the vast majority of patients actually are just restarts or are patients who are switching from one, one regimen to the next, in this case, efavirenz to TLD. So we have a really scary scenario in front of us, if I'm right. Um, so look at this, this is data, it's quite data, uh, like it was, came out about five years ago, 2017. But you can look at the obesity rates in South Africa, particularly as you get richer, and South Africa is much richer than the rest of the, um, the region around us, other than Botswana. Um, but you can see as you get richer, you get larger. And um, I remember going to Malawi and somebody joking with me and saying, the only people who are obese in Malawi are doctors and politicians. And I, you know, I can show you some pictures in just a moment. But if this is true, um, it might be that we are see, going to see obesity as a consequence of all modern antiretroviral therapy. If TAF and integrase inhibitors are not, have got nothing to do with weight gain, it might mean that all, you know, as our ARVs get less and less metabolically toxic, that this might actually just happen SOMA because they're South Africans, not because the ARVs are causing this. Um, and in fact, we had an obesity physiologist speak at Croy in 2019, and she, she knew nothing about HIV, but she said, this is what happens with any inflammatory condition. And it doesn't matter whether you're talking about rheumatoid arthritis or you're talking about inflammatory cancers. Um, if you switch off the inflammation, people gain weight and they become obese. That's it's a natural part of, it seems a natural part of physiology in response to switching off inflammation is that people tend to put on weight. And she's not surprised that HIV positive people are becoming obese, uh, more so than the general population, disproportionate even to what you're seeing in the general population. So when you think about an obesogenic South Africa, coupled with an obesogenic disease like HIV, treated HIV, we're in a very, very scary situation. And we may have missed all of this because we were dealing with drugs that were not showing this. We had essentially thinning drugs, D4T, tenofovir, and efavirenz in our old regimens that were hiding this from us. Now, switching focus now is that we also have to remember that there are lots of people with very good vested interests to try and make us worry about this. And there's people like me who've got a new career in obesity. There are lots of pharmaceutical companies who are now already jockeying for positions saying my drug makes you smaller than your drug. And then we have governments who have got no interest whatsoever in this being a side effect. I have one government in particular who's denying that weight gain is even a problem. Um, north of our borders. There are donors who just don't want to hear about this. There are budgets now that might need to be repurposed for obesity agents. So lots and lots of vested interests are at play here. Let's also remember that sometimes there are lots of data to suggest that larger might be better. And we've known about this in HIV forever. You know, the higher you'll see, the higher your BMI, the slower your CD4 count went down in the bad old pre-ARV days. And we know that if your, CD, if you, your BMI is high, your CD4 count goes up faster. So, you know, if you're going to be evidence-based, you should have a McDonald's in every ARV clinic um, rather than worrying about, you know, your, your other stuff. And I, I must tell you, I don't know the HIV status or any of these individuals, but South Africans are prone to obesity and our politicians are a case in point. And as are, and I'm not fat shaming here, I'm just saying that this is what's happening. And certainly I was, I've been paying far more attention to African politicians, but you can see as your wealth goes up, your weight goes up. And certainly as um, yeah, across the world, as people's um, wealth goes up, their weight goes up and it doesn't go backwards. So um, I've had to turn myself into an um, 
obesity specialist. And I just want to let you all know that relearning endocrine pathways is a human rights affront um, when you're over the age of 50. And that's what I've had to do. And I've had to relearn hormones that sound like they come straight out of Game of Thrones characters rather than like, you know, our physiology textbooks. And it is completely different to what I learned at medical school and certainly as a registrar in internal medicine. Um, and it's interestingly very similar to HIV in many ways. There's lots of stigma, there are lots of these funky new drugs that are incredibly expensive that are not being made available to poor countries or even in rich countries. And that treatment approaches are rapidly evolving in a way that I have been really challenged about. Um, the other thing about obesity that is important to understand is that it's progressive. Like once it's on, it stays on and it gets worse rapidly. So just like diabetes and hypertension, it's not going to reverse by itself. Um, and it's there forever. And lots of people say to me, how long, you know, like do you take obesity drugs for? And I'm like, well, with hypertension, you don't ask that question. You know, you want, once you start the drugs, you stay on them. Um, it's also very, very controversial. I have watched obesity experts having huge fights um, in a way that's very reminiscent of the HIV world. And um, the understanding of the mechanisms of weight gain is evolving very, very rapidly. Like I said, very different to what I was taught in the past. I've been yelled at by obesity activists in the same way I used to get yelled at by HIV activists. And there's lots of new hope and politics and these new drugs I'm going to talk about in a moment. Lots of new ways of tackling things in a way that is very reminiscent of the way HIV just changed the landscape and the obesity landscape is being changed very quickly as well. Now, the first thing that's going to shock you, and I think what's going to shock you, certainly shock me, is how categoric this is. And I'm going to use language that maybe is going to shock you. So not bad language, just straight language. So the way I probably thought about it in the past, the way probably most of you think about it, the way the lay public think about it, most healthcare workers is that the reason people are obese is they're a little bit lazy, they put anything in their mouth, they lack self-control and that they don't exercise enough and it's not their fault. The amazing thing is when you go to obesity seminars and things, nobody talks like that. It's all the environments. They're like, there's, um, it's all about your genes that in fact you program for this that it's all about the social determinants that the food around you is so addictive and so crafted and you are so primed to put food in your mouth it's it's almost out of your control it's tough like you almost like a vector of of, of for this food to get into that you it's there's very little that you can do to control becoming obese that's not totally true there's things that you can do and people work around this but they there's very little blame in, in the language. And they often, one of the obesity people I talk to spends very little time talking about exercise and diet, spends most of their time talking about, you know, how they're going to craft their environment in terms of making sure that um, they're getting their drugs into themselves. Um, and some of the really interesting things is that only non-obesity people think exercise and diet work for weight loss. Everybody agrees that exercise and, and eating properly is really important for your health. So Please, I'm not saying anything about that not being important for your health. Nobody in the obesity field thinks that diet and exercise works for weight loss. Like none of them. There's a tiny percentage of people who manage to get their weight down in the medium term um, and maintain it. But the percentage is so small and unpredictable. Nobody even thinks it's really a viable strategy. Um, and there's some of the studies here that you can look at. And I'll show you one study in particular about how this stuff gets crafted by the people who believe this stuff. Um, but it's so categoric that you know, there's an NEJM review which says, um, wait, you know, move more and, and this, this kind of move more, eat less of conventional guidelines still exists in, in the DOH guidelines, still exists in WHO guidelines. No one in, the, in like the, none of the obesity um, guidelines actually talk about this at all. They emphasize exercise and or activity levels. They emphasize diet, they, not diet. They actually talk about just eating properly and cutting out processed food. But that's part of what we all should be doing. It's got nothing to do with weight loss. It mitigates further weight gain. That's important, but it doesn't do anything. So if you're already overweight, this is going to do diddly squat for helping you. There's also tons of debate about normal values, and I'll come to some of that. And that there's lots of talk about BMI and lots of debate about it. And there's also lots of talk about how you prime for obesity. So your genes really do a lot for you. And unfortunately, like Jeff Wing, who I walk about, says the first thing about obesity is to choose your parents well. Um, and many of us grew up talking about um, Barker's hypothesis and starvation in the womb. And there's tons of um, 
stuff about the epigenetics and stuff on this. And as I said to you, this idea of the inflammatory disease like HIV actually priming you for further weight gain. And for those of you interested, there's an incredibly good review in the NEGM in 2017 on some of this stuff. So what do we have in terms of weight loss? And now this is not HIV, this is general. And this review was really, really fun to read. So we've got some life, this reviewed the lifestyle interventions. And this was a very politically correct review. And they looked at what I, consider, I call it the kind of treadmill and boiled lettuce leaf group, um, because this is essentially what they did. The, one of the, uh, the look ahead study, which is kind of the like flagship lifestyle event, um, they reviewed these heroic patients. Honestly, the, the intervention was 180 pages long. I was paging through it and it involved uh, trainers and dietitians coming to a home and God knows what all. Um, and you can see that like about 40% of the patients, maybe 30, 40% of the patients managed to lose more than 10% of their weight. Now, 5% is regarded as clinically meaningful, but only 30 or 40% managed to lose 10% of their weight. Now, you can imagine if you've 100 kilograms, you had to lose 10. Now, that's not insignificant, but it's not exactly overwhelming, you know, and maybe 60% lost, 60, 70% lost five kilograms. Like, it's not exactly, again, not exactly you know, you had to like really be miserable to lose that level of weight. And remember that most of them actually um, overshot their weight after that. So um, this is not exactly overwhelmingly reassuring advice. So this is at one year and at two years, as I said, most of them had actually regained all that twice. So this is the lifestyle intervention. So it's not great. I went, this got sent to me by somebody saying, look, it works. And I was like, oh, good. The conclusion in this study, which is a meta-analysis, is that primary health care can be delivered and can, is effective for weight loss. And the only lesson I took from this study was you must read the results before you go in. And the, at two years, the mean difference in weight gain was 1.8 kilograms. This involved, again, primary health care where people came to a home, like dietitians and, um, again, life, uh, like sort of exercise enthusiasts and people, to lose 1.8 kilograms. Like I was like, if I weighed 100 kilograms and I wanted to lose a decent amount of weight, 1.8 kilograms seems almost homeopathy. You know, like I would want people to come to my home and make me miserable for 1.8 kilograms. And um, again, you know, this is like when you're a believer, 1.8 kilograms, that's not even clinically meaningful. It's not 5%. So again, you have to ask yourself like, really? Why would I make myself miserable for 1.8 kilograms? Um, and it was a massive cost um, to the healthcare service. And in a place like South Africa, even in the private sector, I can't imagine that we'd be able to do this. This study, which was done with a whole of people we work with, um, with Jennifer Mankula and Mark Sidner, out, they did this at um, CQC, um, out in um, Matuba Tuba, and I've shown this, many of you have seen this before. But you can see here that many patients actually um, live longer when they have a, a high BMI. So you have to ask yourself some of these weird things that exist in our society, which is that making people lose weight might actually have negative impact. Now there's lots of controversy around these studies which show this and it's been shown in the United States and parts of Europe, but that actually, you know, if you're evidence-based, you might not want people to lose weight and that they might, this weight might be protecting them from stuff. Now, as I said, there's controversy about these studies, but this study from our own communities who are evidence-based might mean that you want to put McDonald's again back into the diet. Nature, almost 10 years ago, um, did one of these meta-analyses and again demonstrated that at the more extremes, um, there is a mortality um, um, cost to being at the more extremes. But you can see that that mortality cost is at the other extreme as well, that being underweight has a cost to it. And in fact, that being kind of overweight, slightly on the B side, at, especially as you get older, actually has a mortality benefit. Kristen Dunkel at the MRC in Cape Town actually this amazing, when I was chatting to her about this said like if you didn't know that being fat was bad for you which BMI would you prefer um, and she said yeah you'd probably want to be overweight or even obese slightly on the obese side because all the data I showed you there actually the mortality was lowest at around 29 30 and that you wouldn't be listening to the stuff you and I were taught at medical school and there's been this huge pushback you know saying that you, the medical community, you talk nonsense that you, you've, put, you've waged almost a cruel and futile war here on fat people. You've ruined people's lives. You've like colluded with people and you now need to think differently. You need a new paradigm. And you've used pseudoscience, um, 
Mm. You've stigmatized people, and a lot of it is actually quite reminiscent of the HIV infected, and what's regarded as quite unacceptable language, certainly in the HIV community um, now. You don't talk about HIV infected. Like some of the people who yelled at me, it was precisely this kind of language I was using. Um, and particularly as the physiology is being reassessed, and I haven't got time to go through it all in at the moment, but I've certainly had to kind of relearn lots of stuff I took for granted. The problem is that obesity is linked to lots of bad things. And it's not as simple as we thought, but there are things which it is linked to. And some recent things, such as poor COVID outcomes, but lots of cancers in particular, but indirectly to things like poor outcomes on diabetes and hypertension. And if you tackle the obesity, you can often remove people from insulin. You can get their blood pressures down, somewhat down. You can get their lipids down. We know that. So it's not as simple as saying obesity is good for you. Keep going. But we do need to reflect as doctors and nurses and pharmacists that we have colluded in an industry that is filled with pseudoscientists. You know, everybody from Tim Noakes to Dr. Oz makes lots and lots of money from making people feel really dreadful about themselves. And they promote crackpot nonsense. I was, I was looking up this morning, this industry is worth $4 trillion and we collude. Like every GP has some nutcase um, weight loss program going on in their practice. Um, every like private person is like, wandering around um, referring people into some or other like you know nutri micronutrient program it really is remarkable how much um, the medical fraternity is actually part of this and those of you who know what a healthy diet is please come and tell me it does seem to me like the obesity industry is like uh, the like the obesity specialists also saying and the dietitians everyone just move away from processed food particularly processed food um, containing sugar um, with additives and that in, in general most diets are associated with weight loss it's just not sustained your body just kicks in and says no 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 we're going to get this back on so in the obesity treating community there does seem to be this growing consensus is that most stuff is worse with obesity if you've got hypertension you've got obesity it's going to be worse if you've got diabetes and obesity it's going to be worse all these things are going to be worse if you've got obesity on board at the same time whether you've got obesity by itself, it's not as clear. Um, but if it's really severe obesity, it probably is worse for you. It's particularly if it's associated with inflammation and that does seem independently associated. So if you're a little bit overweight and you're healthy and you don't have any, you're not hypertensive, all the other stuff, you probably are pretty healthy and that's not associated with bad stuff. So it's not as clear. There's, there seems to be a grayness there that we're not quite clear on. The fast food stuff is just stay away from processed food. Try and focus more on the plant-based stuff. You know, stay away from all this other stuff and stay away from sugar. Um, and while people muddle through what that actually means, that seems to be pretty much the, the good advice. And stay away from, you know, this is why simply moving to a vegan-based food uh, source is not good if what you're eating is like this highly processed rubbish that um, is in some of these plant-based foods. So what else have we got? Now we've got surgery. Now when surgery, bariatric surgery and the various things that they do there, this has come a long way. When I first started hearing about this, it was associated with incredibly high mortality. But the new procedures are very, very safe and very effective. And there is some reversibility associated with it. It's a really interesting field. It's associated with all sorts of interesting neuropsychiatric changes, but it works like a bomb. Um, and unfortunately it's very expensive. Um, even in very rich countries, it's not um, it's not freely available, but it works it works well. What we do have now is a whole range of drugs. Those drugs, the ones on the left, the combination of fentanyl to promote, it's available for about 600 rand a month, and then naltrexone, bupropion, which is much more expensive than that. They are available in South Africa. Um, they they cause about um, between seven to ten percent weight loss over a space of just over a year. Um, they both have side effects and you need to know what you're doing if you're using them. I've gained quite a lot of experience using them in our patients. Um, and then this new wonder drug, which was licensed last year, a drug called semaglutide. It's a diabetic agent that's been reprocessed. You give it subcutaneously once a week. And that's associated with um, a 15% weight loss. It's slightly less if you compare it to placebo, which is associated with two or three percent but you give it once um and that's you can't get it for love or money in south africa because it's been sold out everywhere now everybody's worked out that it works so well um i think what's amazing about i've been using all three of these um it's how reliable it is in the same way you give arvs and the viral load comes down you give these drugs and the weight comes down as long as the patient's able to use them and it's associated with 
you know, some attention to just to, um, decreasing the, the processed foods, people's weight could, does come down on them. It's really remarkable how predictable it actually is. There's also a new wonder drug that was licensed by the FDA just three or four weeks ago, uh, three, three or four months ago, called Tizepatide, um, also injected once a month. Um, only costs, I think, 12 grand a month. Um, but it's probably going to be licensed here quite soon. Also a repurposed diabetic drug. Um, but there are a whole range. You can imagine every drug company under the, um, on, on the planet is seeing this as the next blockbuster. And there's a whole range of them that are coming along. Um, the general side effect profile is really good. Most of them are associated with a bit of nausea. The injectables are. Um, and I'm not going to go into how the mechanisms are. Most of them are associated with appetite suppression. Um, they they are generally quite costly. And for those of you interested, there's a really good, um, written by one of the editors of the NEGM, in fact, um, a review of the, how adipose tissues seem to work now and how these drugs work and the feedback loops and all the rest of it. They are, as you'd expect, very, very expensive than newer agents. And part of my work is uh, taking my activist hat on HIV and taking that across to these drugs. So just some final thoughts about um, where we're going with this, because it's really interesting. And I think it's changing how we're going to go and take this stuff forward. There's, I think you need to counsel your HIV patients up front, and they are all at risk. I think we all know that, you know, they're going to gain weight. I think you need to encourage them to be active and to have a good diet and to eat properly, but that's probably what we all should be doing. Um, but I don't think you should tell them they're going to lose weight. I think you can tell them that they're going to hopefully be able to mitigate further weight gain by doing this, but they're not going to lose weight. It's just, it's just the number of the percentage you actually maintain this is tiny. Um, I don't think we should be switching drugs at this point until we get better evidence. Um, it's going to be an issue for the long actings because we know that some of the um, failures with some of the combinations with the long actings are associated with obesity. Um, patients with higher BMI appear to have a higher viral load failure rate. So there's some troubling stuff with those that data. Um, we, I don't think that at this stage, switching from TLD, if somebody's gaining weight, is going to make any difference. And until we have better data from that, I would discourage you from doing that. I think you should just manage the, the metabolic complications. Luckily, we're not seeing much of that yet, but I think it's probably worth keeping an eye on it. I, I, the obesity therapeutic space is the only option at the moment, to my mind. Um, unfortunately, they're not available in the state or in private through the medical aids, but they're coming. And as I said, we're going to be fighting to get the drug costs down, trying to get them into the state. Um, but for the average patient, the first patient there, for me, that's the only thing she's, she's got going to be able to get is uh, to get a weight down from BMI 44. Nothing else is going to work um, other than these obesity agents. There's no ARV switch and you know, bariatric surgery is not going to happen. So for her, the only thing that's going to turn this stuff around is that. And I guess for all of us is just to start thinking, we have to start thinking about our language in the same way I had to think about my language around HIV all those years ago um, and start thinking about change our mindset around blaming people for being overweight um, and think about for our other patients. I certainly, all these, the way I was talked about obesity metabolism over the years has proved to be wrong. So yeah, I think it's on the one hand, it's interesting and on the other hand, quite exciting that we're moving into something that's going to challenge us in a field that, yeah, has, is very, very different. And I think I'll end it there. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks, Francois. That's that's fantastic as usual, and, and I I hope everyone's learned a bunch of stuff. I know I did when I when I heard this talk. It's it's really 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 good stuff. I'm just looking quickly through the the chat. There's a a couple of questions. One is the the mechanisms. I know it's a human rights violation to try and relearn the pathways, but do we have any sense? So Favrin, I mean, it seems quite linked to the to the actual drug level and and presumably downstream effects on adipose tissue with tenofovir do we understand anything about how it's causing weight suppression or, or pre preventing weight gain rather so yes this is a so favorins it is it's the levels it's like it's almost like a direct toxic lipodystrophy type effect gary gary thinks it's a direct fat and um, toxicity um tenofovir we think it's just a low-grade nausea effect so just affects your um, appetites and there's quite a lot of data show just very low levels of reported nausea, not enough to make you vomit or anything, or even you know, to really trouble you. But in all the studies that use Sinofovir versus something like a Bacavir, um, patients do report a little bit of nausea. Um, in the dual therapy studies as well, Sinofovir versus Dolotigavir 3DC. So we think that's plausible. And you know, a lot of the GLP-1 agonists do that. They just have slight just appetite suppression. So it might be that. Cool. Um, 
And then is a question in the chat about changing from PIs to dolutegravir about uh, lipid levels. I mean, we, we do think, as far as I'm aware, that 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 should be good for lipid levels on the whole, right? Yes. Even though yeah, absolutely. Like, honestly, get them off of the PIs at every opportunity. I think PIs are going to be also extinct in the next five or six years. I think there might be a tiny number of patients still on Darunavir where we're just a little bit too scared, where they've lost all the options. You know, but I th honestly, if Avrins is going to be gone soon, thank goodness. And I think the next thing that's going to be gone are the protease inhibitors. Um, yeah, you know, we've got is latrivir has been re resuscitated, and the data on that is looking amazing. We're going to have lenacapavir quite soon. I suspect probably in the next three or four years. So you don't need to worry about preserving classes. There are lots of things on their way. Mm. And then a, a, a tough question about, um, is there any data showing obesogenic microbiome in people living with HIV that gets passed on to children? That I, I, it's, I, I, that's way too deep <laughs> data for me. I have no idea. I do know there's tons of interesting stuff around the microbiome, but um, yeah, I, I, I was reading obesogenic mic mouse microbiomes this morning, but I got distracted. So sorry, I, don't, <laughs> I can't fill you in on that. That's no, beyond beyond my pay grade too. And then the interesting thing about, you know, ha have we seen this weight gain at all in, in pediatrics? I mean, I, I guess it's a population which doesn't generally gain a lot of weight inappropriately, if you know what I mean, usually because of that's, you know, but but I mean, is, is there anything, any signal in the data so far? I'm not aware of it myself. So in adolescence, I, mean, I hear from the adolescent treating doctors that they're starting to worry. I have, I, I don't think pediatricians on that. I haven't heard the, the anything yet. They do tend to report stuff a little bit later. Kids tend to absorb um, the, you know, whether it's peripheral neuropathy, whether it's lipoatrophy and lipodystrophy, they tend to absorb all the mitochondrial toxicity I'm far better than the adults, but they just, it was quite delayed, like by four or five years later, but they did tend to end up with all the, the, the stuff eventually. So I worry that eventually they're going to pick it up. But like I said, I'm not convinced that this is an ARV toxicity. Mm -hmm. So who knows, you know, maybe sure. we're going to have chubby kids soon as well. <laughs> yes. Cool. I think, I think we can leave it there, but I mean, I, I think in general, I mean, the big thing that we have to get right as clinicians is, is as you said, is to not, Blame these drugs because if, if patients get whiff of that as the possible explanation, that's the last time they ever trust trust the drugs. And as he said, it, it's not people initiating, you know, because they, you know, if, if we're not telling them, it's it's you know, it doesn't really filter down. But it's it's those who switch who can see the weight gain for themselves who, who are, are keen. And it's 